pretty fast uh, in class. So that, uh, of course, when I got back to my office, I realized there were a couple of typos. And so I fixed those. Um, but basically, the idea is that we, we had this equation uh, that was all in terms of width, because we had a relationship between uh, width and this, uh, the elastic uh, sort of influence function that, that we called this A matrix. We coded up that big thing. and. You know, I talked to you about how you can do it without a for loop, right? And sort of explain that to you. And so this makes that big A matrix really quickly. Uh, and then that gives us a relationship between pressure and width. And so then when we plug that into the equation, then we have an equation that's only, the only unknown is width. Now, of course, you see pressure in here, but that's just a convenience variable because we actually pressure itself is a function of width, right? So width is the only argument to this compute residual function, right? So the idea here, remember, with this residual is this is a nonlinear equation, and we're, we're trying to, you know, if we just, if, we, if I just guess a width, right? If I just guess a width and I plug it in here, it's not going to equal, this equation should equal zero. It's not going to. And that out of balance part is what we call the residual, and we want to drive that thing to, to zero. Okay. Now, if you remember last class, what I did was after we wrote that compute residual function, we had this compute time step function. We had this compute time step function, and I used a call to uh, Psi pi's Newton Krylov method, which is a nonlinear solver, right? And so we just basically, I fed the residual into that, and this is sort of an optimization routine that we we're trying to drive the residual to zero. And I only did in class that day because of, you know, we ran up against the bell, I only did one time step, right? And then when I got back to my office and I started looking at it, uh, I could only get that solver to converge. The, the equation's highly nonlinear, right? It's got like a width to the fourth in it, uh, in one term at least, right? And so I can only get that s solver to converge uh, for very, very tiny time steps, right? And, you know, we want to run a hydraulic fracture. This is in seconds, right? So we want to run a hydraulic fracture simulation for minutes or hours at least. And we, you know, if we have to take steps that small, it's going to take a while. And so it's sort of uns un anytime I try to take a larger time step, uh, the solver wouldn't convert. And I uh, couldn't figure out why, you know, the, the, the solver is packaged up, right? It's, it's sort of just a function call to me. And without getting into the source code of SciPy, which is a, you know, I sort of went on a spill last time about why you should use Python versus MATLAB. And, and that's one of the reasons I actually have access to the source code. I could have get in there and I could look at the details of the compiled code and everything. But instead of doing that, um, you know, another thing I can do is I can write my own nonlinear solver. We talked about how to do it in class, and I wasn't, I was hopeful that we wouldn't have to do that, that we'd just use, a, use another implementation. But, uh, but now, yeah, I mean, I was running into problems using the SciPy implementation, so I thought today we'd just write our own nonlinear solver, right, and go through the steps. And so, if you remember, we talked about in class, this is from the notes from a few days ago, that uh, if, you, if you tailor expand this residual, right, this is just your out of balance force. You tailor expand it, and then you ignore the higher order terms, and you get the, sort of this equation that uh, an increment in W right, is equal to uh, basically the solution of, of this equation, right? So the, the, the inverse of the tangent stiffness matrix which the tangent stiffness matrix is the derivative of the residual with respect to every degree of freedom, okay, uh, times the old value of the residual give us a new increment for the, disp for the uh, width, and then we can just keep iterating like that, okay? So 
Remember I told you anytime you start to write a for loop or in MATLAB or Python, you should stop yourself and see if there's a better way to do it because it slows the code down tremendously. Well, in this case, there's unfortunately not a better way to do it. So we're going to have to write the for loop, right? So I'm just going to say for, um, uh, and I don't actually need an iteration index here, so I'm just going to say for blank in range of 10. We'll just start with 10. So basically, I'm going to say do, do something 10 times, OK? And what we're going to do is increment that residual, try to compute a better and better guess, OK? And so the first thing we need to do is just compute the residual. So OK. So th this function is going to compute one time step, right? So at any given time step, we're going to use the old width as our initial guess. So we have the width from the previous time step. We're going to use it as our initial guess. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute the residual with the old width. Right? Now, if our guess was perfect, right? if, if the width, if, if you know, this is a width distribution across all the grid blocks, right? so it's a vector. If this is perfectly the exact width, then this is the residual is going to be zeros, right? and we and we converged and we stopped. But of course, we're not. It's not going to be zeros. I mean, we're we're not going to have initial guess perfectly. Right? So um, we're going to have to come up with some stop criterion, and what I what I'm going to use is the norm of the residual as my stop criteria, right? So the, the L2 norm or the, the Euclidean norm, right? So this is a vector. This is a vector that I want to be all zeros, right? If it's perfect, it's all zeros. So I want a scalar value to determine when to stop my simulation. And what I'm going to use is the norm of that vector, right? Because if, the, if this were all zeros, then the norm of it would also be zero, right? The norm being take the square the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries, right? The, the, the L2 norm, right? So uh, there's actually a, a built-in function in NumPy uh, for that, although it's not that hard to code up yourself. So the first thing I'm going to do is compute the residual, then I'm going to compute its norm, and then I'm going to determine if we can stop the, iter the, the loop or not. Right? So I'm going to say if the residual norm is less than some tolerance, and I don't really know what it should be right now, but I'll just say uh, 10 e to the minus, or 1 e to the minus 8. So So I, I always do this in, in place of a while statement, and I think this is a good coding habit. You really should, in my opinion, never use while loops. Right? So remember, a while loop is like, if some condition is true or false, then you stop the loop. Problem is, you could put a, make a bug in your code, and it, you, you may never re meet that condition, and then you get stuck in an infinite loop. Right? And so I always have a preference to use a for loop with an if break statement. Right. So here, uh, I'm just going to go for something 10 times, right? So worst case, I, get, I go this 10 times, and it stops, and then you know, my, my code reports back. In the, in the, in the best case, uh, I, could, I could have my width be perfect on the first cycle, and I just do these computations, and then I stop. So one of the reasons I decided to write my own solver, uh, again, because I couldn't figure out why the other one wasn't converging, I didn't have enough granularity. I couldn't see into the code enough, uh, well enough. So here, I'm actually, at least, at least in the sort of debugging phase, I'm going to use a print statement here to give me some information about how my iteration is progressing. So I'm just going to say residual norm 
equals um, right, so it's just going to print to the screen uh, the, the, the value for the residual norm e at each iteration, and that's going to help me. Okay. So now, and this is sort of the hardest part, really. We got we have to compute the tangent stiffness. This guy. This guy. Now the, the residual is a vector, and and this is a vector. Right? So this is the derivative of a vector with respect to a vector, which gives you a matrix. Right? So in other words, what is, what I'm saying here is, this is the derivative of the residual with respect to every with respect to a change in every degree of freedom. So we're going to compute this, and there's other ways to do it. This is this is probably the worst way, uh, but it's it's sort of the, the clearest way. We're going to compute this via finite difference. All right, so I guess I should have brought my tablet, but basically remember the residual is a function of the width. Okay. So and the width, of course, is a vector. So what we're going to do is we're going to perturb one degree of freedom of that width vector. By some small value of h. Right? And so this ej is just a it's just a unit vector in the jth degree of freedom direction. Right? So let's say this is the Ith entry. So the so the ith entry right, we're gonna perturb. So basically it's just like for the first degree of freedom it's one zero 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 zero. For the second degree of freedom it's zero one zero zero zero. And then we're just going to perturb that by some small number, minus the original functional evaluation all over that small number. Right? That's going to give me the ij entry of the tangent stiffness curve. Okay. Now, this is the reason this is the worst way to do this. Well. For this Newton out for the Newton algorithm to work well, you need a really good estimate of what this is. It needs to be really precise. And so this is only really precise when this is really small, right? But the problem is if I make this really small, I have some number that's only different from this number by a really small number. So I'm subtracting, I'm subtracting two numbers that are really close to one another. And in a, in a computer, this is you get subtractive cancellation errors, and then this can cause a problem. So, you know, while I might be tempted to make that thing like, you know, e to the mi one e to the minus one hundredth, I'm almost definitely going to get subtractive cancellation errors there. So I want this to be as small as I can, so that it's accurate, so my Newton iteration works well, my Newton Raphson scheme. But at the same time, it can't be too small, or I'll get subtractive cancellation errors. So, how do we implement this? Right. So, first thing we have to do is allocate the tangent stiffness. So we're just going to use that zeros function, and we know that it's going to be the size of the residual. Squared. I mean, you know, it's a square, it's a matrix, so it's going to have the same number of rows and columns as a residual vector. Okay, so now just that just made space for it. Now I have to fill it with the appropriate thing. 
And so I'm going to use another root loop for this, even though, uh, you know, if this was a really large production code, I'd want to think about doing something else here. But for the, you know, clarity of, of illustration here, I'm just going to use a loop. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to compute one column at a time all at once. So I'm just saying, basically, or I, you know, technically that's column, I guess. I, I'm going to leave it row, and I'm just going to transpose it at the end. Of that. So I'm going I'm to compute one row of the tangent stiffness at a time. So this is just the residual. Uh, this is the size of the residual, and the range function just gives me, you know, so this, if this number is 7, because there's 7 grid blocks, then that's just going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? So rho is going to take on that value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And it's going to, you know. So I'm going to create this perturbation vector, Dij. I'm going to call it perturb vector. It needs to be the size of the residual. So I'm just I'm creating it by creating a, a vector of zeros that's the same size as the residual. And then I'm going to perturb So this is this is my h value. Right? So so whatever row we're constructing at this time, you know. So if this is the zero, the first time through the loop, this will be zero. So I'll perturb the first entry, like I had there. Remember Python. So this is h. Right? And then the second time through, I'll create my zero vector again and perturb that value. And the third time through, I'll look like that. All right. So then, I'm going to create the the matrix one row at a time. So I'm going to first on the first pass through, I'll fill in the first row, this, then the second row, then the third row. And so, I'm going to actually do this finite difference calculation now. So I'm going to call compute residual on the width plus a small change in one of the degrees of freedom. So width plus perturb vector. minus residual. All over So that's that's this equation. Okay with that? So the res the residual I already computed up there, and so I don't have to call it call it again. Now I could get a more accurate estimate here if I I could also then say I could do a central difference if I did this. Also do that, but the difference is so that would give me a more accurate estimate. But then I have to do two another, an additional function call every time. It was this guy I computed it once and I stored it. Uh, and this is a pretty expensive 
calculation, so. Okay. So after I go through after I go through this loop, then I will have because each time I come through, I'm, I'm recreating the perturbation vector to perturb a new degree of freedom, right? And then, so once this, this loop completes, then K is full. Right? It's, it's been assembled, okay? Now, I, I assembled it row by row, so I need to actually, if you look at here, uh, well, I, I assembled it row by row, so I want to trans, what it really needs to be is column by column. And so I need to transpose the matrix. So I'm going to transpose the matrix, and then I'll also put a negative sign in front of it in preparation for this, this, this calculation right here. So. I'm also going to, in, when I do this uh, transpose thing, I'm also going to turn it into a sparse matrix. So so I just took the negative inverse of it. And when I did, I, I changed it into a sparse matrix. And the reason for that is that th this matrix is not that sparse, actually. You know, sparse matrix would be one that's full of zeros, right? Uh, this guy is not that sparse because that influence function, the elasticity, the boundary, the boundary element method, uh, remember, is a function of you know, the width at any point is a function of the width everywhere. Or I'm, I'm sorry, the pressure at any point is a function of the width everywhere over the fracture surface. That was in that A matrix. Remember, it was completely dense. Okay, So this is not that sparse a matrix. So I don't really gain anything uh, by storing, in a, using a sparse matrix format to store it. Because in, in a sparse matrix format, you don't store the zeros in a matrix. right? They, they only store the non-zero values. Okay? And so normally, you would use that for storage purposes. But the reason I want to use it is because when I solve this thing, when I solve this equation, and this takes a little bit of knowledge about numerical methods uh, to sort of know why I would do this, but when I solve this, I'm not actually going to take the inverse of it. Right? I could just literally compute the inverse. Uh, that would be a direct solve. I'm not going to do that. Okay? I'm going to use an, an iterative solver. And to use an iterative solver within SciPy, I have to have a, and MATLAB for that matter too, I have to first have a sparse matrix. So if you, if you, get, if you use an iter, if you use the sparse matrix, you'll automatically use an iterative solve. It won't try to solve it directly. Right? So by like direct inversion of the matrix. Right? So you guys remember from numerical methods like a direct solve versus an iterative solve? Right? A direct solve, you, you use like Gauss elimination, right? to literally invert the matrix. Whereas in, a, in an iterative solve, you, you, know, you choose some x vector, plug it in, take, take the output, plug it back in, you, and you keep iterating. Right? That's Gauss-Seidel, right? or Jacobi. You probably remember that. OK. So. Back to the equations, we're at this step right here. We're computing the, the change in width. Right? So we have this. All we have to do now is multiply it by the residual vector. And again, I'm going to use a sparse solve to do this operation. I'm not actually going to invert this and multiply it by the residual vector. That's what that line does. So this returns the solution to that equation, k inverse times r. 
and then I can print. I want to print the width, but uh, okay. So then I can say the width equals the old width plus the change in width. And we'll uh, we'll get pr print just for debugging purposes. Print what the width is. Okay. If I didn't make any mistakes, I should be able to run that function. So it's telling me my matrix is singular. So I should be able to check that by So I'm trying to, sorry. I, I did work this in my office before I came over here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm reading, I must have made a, I'm reading off the code I wrote that worked earlier. So I must have made a, a typo somewhere, but let me try to debug it. Um, So for, I want to look at the eigenvalues of uh, k. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's one problem. That's it's one of the beauties of Python, I think. It makes it, the language beautiful, but it, it also gets, gets you. Space is syntax in Python. Right? So you know there's no in for, right? or in the if. Right? There's no ins anyway. It sort of that makes it a, a code elegant and readable. And it forces you to indent properly. The space is syntax, meaning everything that's indented over is in the, underneath that for loop, right? OK? That's part of that for loop. So it makes you, it forces you to write your code in a readable way and use the indentation properly. Turns out it doesn't matter what the indentation is. Like if you have a personal preference, you like two spaces or you like four spaces. Or you like 27 spaces, it doesn't matter what it is, it has to be consistent. That's it. And so, what happened there, uh, what happened there when I ran that, all of this code from here down was still under the for loop. And so, that was a bug. And so, all I did was take that and moved it over. And remember last time I told you to use a proper editor? Did you see how fast I did that? Huh? So, let me go back. Right, that's what it was. And this is how you MATLAB users would do it. See what I did? By using the proper editor. Saved myself 15 keystrokes, right? And I do that, I sit, you know, I write, I wrote, write code for 15 years, all day, every day. I saved myself weeks of productivity. Okay, so let's try it again. <laughs> 
Hold on. But you, so, uh, you know, there's some, I have some extra granularity there that gives me some information about what's happening. And I can tell you right now, one thing's very bad. On the first pass through, with my initial guess, the residual was that. That was a blind, dumb guess, and that was the residual. It should be getting smaller. It's not, right? So there's a bug somewhere. worse. Sorry. Ah. I don't see it, but there's a bug somewhere. <laughs> uh, I'll figure it out. But that, so that's basically, because uh, again, I worked this in my office and I had it working. Just don't see. But that's 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 a basic Newton iteration. Um, th there are things I, we're not going to do it now, but there are things you can do. To, to make it better, namely by, ma namely you can precondition this guy. Uh, so remember, an, an iterative solver solves this type of equation, right? By picking an x, computing this, taking the out of balance part and using that to find a new x and keep, we keep doing that. Um, but you might think of this as uh, inverting. I mean, you can think of this, it, the iteration as, as inverting the equation, right? The, the actual solution to this is the inverse of A times B, right? So I can make the iteration go faster. The more, like, well, let me ask this question. If A were diagonal, right, just a diagonal matrix, what would its inverse be? What's the inverse of a one over the, or, or what's the inverse of a diagonal matrix? Yeah, it's just one over the diagonal entries, right? It's really easy to, there's nothing easier to take the inverse of a diagonal matrix. Right? So. The more diagonal 
A is, or the more diagonally dominated it is, the faster the iteration will go. And so, I mean, what would, there's something I can multiply here, right? So instead of solving this equation, I could also multiply both sides on the left by some preconditioner. I'll call it a matrix M. And so then I'll, I'm going to solve this equation instead, right? And the purpose of M is to make the product M times A more diagonal, right? So what's the best preconditioner? What's the best M I could choose? What would make A perfectly diagonal? How about A inverse? If I chose M to be a equal to A inverse, right? then A inverse times A is the identity matrix, and I've just solved the equation. Right? Now, of course, you wouldn't actually do that because then you've, I mean, you're sort of not, sort of defeating the purpose of using it as a solver if you're actually going to compute A inverse. But there are things, the, the point of that is, is there are things you can choose for M, okay, that makes this product more diagonal, if you will, more diagonal, and then it speeds up the iteration. So um, there, there are other things you can do. That, that would be within the framework of the linear solver. There are other things you can do on the nonlinear solver side uh, to help. Because remember, in, in any nonlinear solver, there's a linear solve in, between, in the middle, right? So the linear solve is happening here every time. And the, and the outer loop is this Newton iteration loop. So the idea here, and, and I, I'll go just go back. I'm not going to sit here and force you guys to watch me debug this code. But the idea here would be, and I'll go, so I'll go back to my office and get it fixed. Uh, the idea here is that once once this is this iteration is done, then I have my new width at the at the end of that time step, right? So then then I can increment time, right? So then I would go down here. I would go down here and now increment time. So I, so basically, all that up there is just computing one time step. okay? And at the end of that, that's my new width, my converged width. Right, so that's the width at the end of that time step. Then I'm going to take another step in time and do it all over again. Right? And so then, you know, and then, so then I can store the width as a function of time progressively, and I can plot that. And if I know the width, then I can use my elastic influence function to determine the pressure. Right? Then I can get the pressure distribution also. So then the last thing, and I guess we'll just do that Wednesday, is you know, that, that's only, you know, if I continue to eject into it, that's just going to open the fracture. Right? It's not going to grow. So then, then the thing is, how do we grow? And, and basically, we grow the fracture by inserting elements on the end. So we're going to look at the, the fracture toughness. So we know the width, we can use the displacement discontinuity to determine the, the stress intensity factor. And if the stress intensity factor exceeds the fracture toughness, then we'll grow the fracture. Right? And we'll just grow it by inserting an element on the end, and then we'll solve the whole problem again. We'll just continue to do that. And you know, this method is sort of the simplest implementation you could come up with. And it's not that accurate in the sense that um, you, know, you shouldn't just sort of arbitrarily insert an element because it, you're stepping along in time and so there's an implicit time in, in the sense that it, you know I'm stepping along in time and at some point I'm just saying the fracture grew and I'm and I'm and I'm forcing it to grow by a fixed amount right so that's not really accurate uh, it, it would only be accurate in the limit of Delta X going to zero and Delta T going to zero right so we're not going to go through any more than that but but you know just know there, there, there's more, a lot of more advanced things you can do, uh, but you know, what we're doing is sort of the simplest implementation we can come up with. And as you can see, it's not that simple. Right? <laughs> and this is nonlinear solve and all this stuff. Right? So it's, it's sort of why we can't. Uh, you know, well, hydraulic fracture modeling is hard. I guess is the is the the lesson here. I mean, that's why, you know, an undergraduate class, I can't really expect you to do a whole lot. It's probably pushing it to even be showing you guys this stuff, and this is like the simplest one-dimensional model. 
So anyway, I guess we'll stop there. I'll go debug my code.